All right, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, who's, uh, Charlie Sanabria from NHMFL and FSU, who's going to talk about re-examining the heat treatment of RRP9310 and potential for further improvements. All right, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I come from a national mag lab at FSU, and over the last couple of years, I've been collaborating with Brooker in an attempt to optimize their RRP wires using metallography and microscopy. And today I will be talking about a re-examination of the heat treatment of RRP wires uh, and, and the potential for further improvements. Now, the, talk, uh, the outline of the talk is the following. Now, first, I want all of us to be familiar with what the standard heat treatment of RRP wires is and why it was chosen. Then I will show you what really happens during the standard heat treatment of RRP wires. And once we're all in touch with reality, it begs the question, can we skip the 215 step? And, uh, but what I really want to show you is what happens during the 400 degree step, uh, which I now call the copper diffusion step. Because uh, tweaking this step seems to unleash a, uh, an important aspect of RRP wires that we were not aware of uh, as far as critical current goes. Finally, I'll talk a little bit more about what, where we can go next. So first things first, what is the standard heat treatment and why do we use it? I'm sure you're all familiar with what the standard, with the uh, development of an RRP wire looks like, but here it is again, uh, the cross section, an aerobin barrier that is surrounding a, an array of neighbor filaments uh, that are inside a copper matrix, and they themselves are surrounding a tin core, although separated by a copper annulus. And you also have a few nave and titanium rods for doping purposes. And that's all there is to it. And it may be surprising for many people who see this for the first time that this looks completely different once you react it. Here's a, a scanning electron image of a, an actual uh, sub-element, a real sub-element. And oh, here's a better pointer. There you go. And um, you are left with a little bit of nave and barrier. But now, instead of the array of filaments, you have a solid and continuous ring of nave and 310. The copper is now in the center, and you've produced some voids uh, because of the density changes of these phases. And it is believed that you have to go through three steps in, uh, uh, for that reaction to happen. And uh, it has to do the, this. This is the standard heat treatment, and it, has, it was based on an idealized thermodynamic reasoning that has to do with the copper tin phase diagram. Here it is, very complicated. Let me uh, break it down a little bit here. We have copper, uh, pure copper, to which when you start adding uh, tin, you produce bronze. However, if you add more tin, you eventually precipitate an, a, a phase called epsilon. And if you keep further more adding tin, you precipitate another phase called eta. And if you keep adding even more tin, you precipitate tin itself which melts at 227 degrees Celsius. Um, Ada melts at 408, epsilon mel uh, decomposes at 676. So if I color this uh, heat treatment profile over here, you may have already guessed where, where we're going. We have uh, three different melting temperatures and we have three different steps. That's exactly what this heat treatment is doing, is holding the temperature right below the melting point of each one of these phases in an attempt to mix things as much as you can before you cross their melting points, their, their melting uh, temperatures. So here we have a sub-element at room temperature. You heat it up, you start mixing up your copper, your tin, you produce some epsilon, you produce some eta, uh, and it is hoped that you if you hold this for long enough, you will get rid of the tin. You will uh, consume all of the tin, therefore you won't be bound by this 227 degree uh, melting temperature. You can keep going with the heat treatment. You go to 400, repeat the same process, except for eta this time at 408 degrees or 400 uh, degrees, so you can uh, get rid of uh, this, this limitation of 408 degrees Celsius, you can, and you're ready to go. You can go react your nave in 310, and the copper apparently gets pushed to the center of the sub-element. And it looks very similar to what I showed you at the beginning, right? But that's not what happens. This is what happens. No matter how long you hold it at 215, you will always be left with a little bit of tin. In fact, about 30% of the tin you started with will be left behind. And uh, so, so right from the beginning, this will liquefy. So right from the beginning, that noble mission of the, the standard heat treatment of preventing liquefaction is not realistic. So uh, the time runs out. You have to keep going with the heat treatment. Melt, tin melts, although it doesn't really leave any lasting uh, effect. And here we bumped into the first unexpected thing about the, the heat treatment. Uh, most of the sub-elements, our cores, are made of eta at this point. You have 
and you have a new phase uh, that forms uh, around the eta. This phase is called Nausite, after Michael Naus, who discovered it in 2002. And in 2013, Ian Pung also noticed that um, the Nausite seems to manifest itself in, in the form of a ring around this, the, the, the eta phase. And I call this the Nausite membrane now. And since I've been studying the Nausite membrane, I've noticed, the first thing I noticed was that voids appear on the outside of the Nausite membrane in between the filaments where the copper was. And I also noticed that epsilon is now more prominent in the, inside the cores, which only leads to one logical conclusion. The copper is flowing through the membrane, migrating into the core, uh, so long as this Nausite membrane exists. Now, just like it happened at 215, that you're left with a little bit of tin, you will be left with a little bit of eta, no matter how long you hold it. And uh, it will melt, and it does melt, once you keep going with heat treatment. And here we won't bump into the second and expected thing about this heat treatment. Uh, the first thing I noticed was, well, voids are, are now all over the place and in, in, in between the subelements. Most of the, core, most of the copper is now in the core. But notice that wherever the liquid was, there seem to be these nausite chunks that grew. The liquid seems to attack the niobium and it forms nausite rather quickly. And uh, the heat treatment keeps going. Nausite decomposes into MBSN2, which is, was uh, uh, hinted by Christian Schroeder in 2008. And finally, you react your niobium 310. Your copper was already in the core. And it looks also very similar to what I showed you at the beginning, right? But now we can look at a small detail that you may have no, not noticed before. There are these irregular and disconnected pieces, sometimes disconnected pieces of niobium 310. We now understand where these come from. We've been calling these niobium dissolution for a long time, but they are the effect of nausite. And if you don't like the cute animations I just gave you, here are real images. Here's a sub-element uh, with a nausite membrane in all its glory, uh, diffusing copper in, eta, some eta left behind. It liquefies, the liquid starts attacking the niobium very quickly. Uh, although it's hard to see in this picture, but once the liquid is gone, you see the chunks. And uh, now side decomposes into MBSN2. And once you react everything, you form niobium 310. However, whatever was MBSN2, meaning whatever was now side, ends up being disconnected and usually large grain. But, and that's obviously not good. You, 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 don't, you were trying to run current through these things, and if they're disconnected, that doesn't work. But there, if you pay attention, although complicated as pr this process is, the root of all, e all that evil disconnection is whatever happened in this step. So we really need to pay attention to that step. It's very, very important, right? So what are we doing at the 215 step? Uh, let me put this over here to remind you that now site is inevitable. But over here, we have a, a kind of sort of a kinetic stalemate with the, where the tin is trying to get out. It produces some eta, it produces some epsilon, but it can't really get past the first or second row of subelements. It just st gets stuck. Time runs out. You have to keep going with the heat treatment. And in a wonderful leap of thermodynamics, you, in, within eight hours at 400 degrees, you get a denalcite membrane configuration that I already showed you. So if this is as important as I've been talking about, which we'll talk about a little later, but uh, if I, I told you this, this step, these two steps are important. So what are we doing here? And most importantly, can we skip it? Well, we tried skipping it. We did this heat treatment that you see over here. We kept everything the same except step skipping the 215. And when I looked at the subelements, they look exactly the same. Same now site membrane form, same copper diffusion happened. So if this step is the same, regardless of whether we do this or not. And this step is not change. We haven't changed it yet. What happens to the final properties of the wires? What are the final properties of the wires? It turns out they're exactly the same. Within the measurement, uh, error, error measurement, same triple R, same JC, same N value, same uh, Kramer field. So yes, we can skip the 215. Now we get into the important part, or the exciting part. Aside from a copper diffusion, um, and you, you may have already noticed that the now site membrane seems to get thicker with time. And since now site is the root of dissolution, well, we wanted to measure, to understand how it grew. And we measured its thickness uh, at various temperatures and times. And using a Arrhenius equation, we could act, calculate its activation energy, allowing us to predict some values. And what we learned is that reducing the temperature seems to be beneficial if we were to suppress the now site membrane growth. So that's one thing. The other thing that happens in the copper diffusion step is the copper diffusion itself. And that we kept track of as well. We measured the area fractions of these eta and epsilon phases. And since they're essentially line compounds, we can translate area fractions into atomic percent, percent tin. 
And we did that for many sub-elements per wire. And once we averaged all of these and plotted them as a function of time, uh, it turns out temperature is not really that much of a factor here. All of these drop almost at the same rate. Time is more influential here. So we designed a new heat treatment that maximizes the copper diffusion, minimizes the nowside formation, and we landed at 350 for 400 hours. And as far as the nowside and, and the copper diffusion goes, well, we created them, we grew an outside membrane that is 44% thinner, and we diffuse 17% more copper into the core. If you're wondering what, what does that look as far as dissolution, well, you can see by these two pictures very clear, there's barely any dissolution over here. So that was good, we were very happy about it. Of course, we have to back this up with JC measurements. Once we did that, we noticed that at least for this group of sub-elements, of, of filaments, sorry, wires, at least for this group of wires, we ended up with a, a, a JC increase of about 28% at 16 Tesla, and uh, at, at about 1.4 increase in the Kramer field, 1.4 uh, Tesla increase in the Kramer field. So we are really pushing it there. We're getting closer to the FC, FCC targets, especially if you look at the sub-element sizes that I have over here. We're talking about between 50 and 35 microns in size. Take this wire, for example, uh, JC, we're using the standard heat treatment at 41 sub-elements, 41 microns of sub-element size, not very impressive. You barely make it to above 2700 mcq per millimeter at 12 Tesla, barely over 1000 at 16. The new heat treatment of the exact wire gives you almost 32 Amps per square, 3,200 amps per square millimeter, 12 Tesla, a little under, a little over 1,300 amps per square millimeter, 16 Tesla. We were very happy about that. And then, in the same spirit of doing lower temperatures and longer times, we noticed that nobody has ever tried a low temperature, long time heat treatment for that A15 uh, step. So we talked to Arup Goch, who recently retired from BNL, and we landed at, in, for, at, at this heat treatment, same mixing as this one. However, we're doing 620 for 600 hours. And uh, although long, we were very happy about the results. It turns out at 41 microns in diameter, let me remind you that, in uh, sub-element size, we reached an unprecedented 3,300 amps per square millimeter at 12 Tesla and a little under 1,400 amps per square millimeter at 16 Tesla. So we're almost, almost there, getting, getting closer to the FCC, but we're not there yet. So where can we go next? Well, I told you now site is pretty much inevitable. It happens. But is this liquefaction inevitable? Um, and uh, that's, uh, the, the, that liquefaction is the source of these now side chunks. We haven't gotten rid, rid of them completely because when I, even when I look at the optimized heat treatment at the end right here, the optimized mixing where all of the copper has pretty much left the filament and now is in the core, we're still left with a little bit of eta, and that will liquefy, that will attack the niobium, and that will cause more dissolution, so, and will cause these, these, these problems. So we, we're looking at the sub-element, and we try to calculate how much more copper do we need to add for that eta to disappear completely. It turns out it's just 5% more copper in the sub-element. We'll give you that. And there will be a reaction that goes like this. You form your now site membrane. You start diffusing your copper into the core. However, this time around, there is enough copper for all of the eta to disappear meaning you will have no liquefaction, you will have no excess now side form, and it will be a fully controlled reaction in which your sub-element, it's only Achilles heel, will be the now site membrane itself, which we understand, and we can uh, make as thin as, we can, uh, as possible through uh, heat treatment alterations. So uh, that's pretty much it, but I, I, I want to um, emphasize that through these kind of heat treatment explorations and sub-element design alterations, I think we can reach this, the FCC target. And it's just a matter of being smart about what we're doing here. We can't just try random things. We really need to understand the processes in order to make important steps towards a, a, a better uh, conductor. And that's it. Thanks. We're running a little late, but does, does anybody have any questions for chat? How about playing with the um, increase in temperature when you go from room temperature to 400 degrees C uh, or 450? Uh, the, the, have you explored whether it matters if you went fast? Ramp rates. No, I have not explored the ramp rates. Um, 
but I, I don't. I, 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 that would be more a more a bigger concern for for magnet manufacturers as far as the wires. I don't think there will be any much of a difference. Um, I'd be just concerned of how much now site forms, if if any, during the ramp rate. Uh, but I wouldn't see that much difference. Yeah. Um, we have been talking about this in the past. Are these round wires, or are you using? No, these are these are just round wires. Yeah, I haven't deformed them. You realize that for FCC, these wires are going to be strongly deformed, and there are other for cables. Mm -hmm. Do you have an answer to that? Uh, and and an answer to to what? Yeah. How to treat highly deformed wires, which will not be as regular as. The right. Yeah. Well, the now side membrane forms even in very deformed wires. I, I've seen that in, in very deformed sub elements. Um, we have. I, I've. I've damaged a few sub elements to see whether it forms or not, and it does form. Uh, and and I would be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised that the the copper also diffuses in. Um, I, I would be more concerned as far as deformed wires about the triple R, uh, but I think JCs are pretty, pretty uh, achievable even in deformed uh, wire yes, uh, sub-elements. But uh, you know that when we handle, we we use rather for cables in these highly deformed wires, a uh, high risk is thin leaks in. Uh, yeah, that's a great point. T t tin leaks. We, maybe we can talk about this later uh, because tin, I strongly believe that tin leaks are a thing of the past. They've never been seen in RRP. Not that I can, that I've heard of anybody seeing them in RRP. I think that was a, a thing of MJR, and uh, uh, yeah, we can talk about that later.